Hello, everyone. Welcome this evening. My name is Sarah Morgan, and I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Property Sculpture Park. And um, I just want to begin by saying that we have closed captioning available on this uh, on Zoom, and I believe that they are also available on Facebook. Uh, and there should be a little icon that you can click at the bottom of your Zoom screen that will start the live captioning feature if that is something that you would like to utilize. I also want to give a land acknowledgement as we begin this evening and state that Socrates Sculpture Park is on the ancestral land and unceded territories of the Lenape, Narsi, and Matinecock peoples. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, this event is our last virtual discussion of the Monuments Now exhibition. Um, and we're thrilled to have three of our fantastic 2020 Socrates Artist Fellows joining us. And then also our fantastic curatorial assistant, Danilo Machado, is moderating. Um, so really quickly, I am going to introduce Danilo and he will take us into the rest of the event. So, Curatorial assistant. Okay, oh, excuse me. One moment. You good? Yes. Right, <laughs> um, that was our um, the that was James. He helps close the park and is a wonderful human being. <laughs> I'm sure the artist fellows remember him. Um, anyways, uh, Danilo. Curatorial assistant Danilo Machado is a poet, curator, and public programmer living on occupied land. Interested in languages potential for revealing tenderness, erasure, and relationships to power, Danilo is the curator of the exhibition, Otherwise Obscured, Erasure in Body and Text at Franklin Street Works 2019 to 2020, and Support Structures at the Eighth Floor Gallery, a virtual presentation 2020 to 2021. A 2020 to 2021 Poetry Project Emerge Surface B Fellow and producer of public programs at Brooklyn Museum. Their writing has been featured in Hyperallergic, Brooklyn Rail, Art Papers, Art Critical, Gender Fail, Tayo Literary Magazine, among others. With Claire Kim, they organized the new streamlined residency for performing artists. They are working to show up with care for their communities. Thank you so much, Danilo. Take it from here. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you all for being here. I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, and this whole series has been such a, a pleasure to get to know each of the um, artist fellows from this year and reflect to many months uh, after the, the show was first installed and even more so until, you know, from the first uh, conception and proposal of, of these um, rich monuments uh, and anti-monuments uh, that we've been able to, to unpack um, and talk about together. Um, so I'll be introducing each of the artists and they'll be doing a short overview of their project at Socrates. Um, and then we'll be in conversation uh, together and take some uh, questions at the end uh, from our audience, uh, if you'll have any. So feel free to use the Q&A function in the chat. Um, so first is Andrea Solstad was born in 1986 in Brooklyn, New York, where she still resides. She's not a scientist, but interested in behaving as one, and though no longer a child, is still curious as one about seemingly dry things like parking restrictions and staying still. Welcome, Andrea. Uh, thank you, Danilo. Uh, nice to be joining you this evening. Um, so as a now, I guess, graduating fellow from Socrates Sculpture Park, um, I created, um, we, we were prompted, I guess, to uh, create a response to the various issues surrounding monuments. And um, although my proposal had begun in one uh, 
area, specifically in contemplating the digital as a place um, to have control and uh, to make a statement that one might not be able to make on land. Um, I think with the pandemic's arrival and other changes in uh, politics and culture, it soon appeared that, or it soon became clear that um, the medium that I had to work in was uh, metal. And of all the metals that were accessible to me, um, in the first slide here, you can see that uh, cans were my first subject um, of experimentation. Um, and then other forms of scrap aluminum, um, you know, oddly enough, aluminum is in fairly decent circulation, especially in comparison to things like silver, gold, brass, you know, all these other traditional metals that monuments have been traditionally um, expressed through. Uh, so yeah, in the first slide, there's um, my initial efforts and experiments in uh, smelting aluminum from existing aluminum. And I think this type of uh, uh, alchemy and chemistry is like really interesting to me because I think in one of my fantasies, you know, like all of these monuments that we have now could be molten down and made into other things, maybe more helpful things like let's say you took the Columbus uh, statue in Columbus Circle and you melted down and you made new water pipes for Flint or something, you know, like, you know, some of them are really quite um, idealistic and who knows how viable that would be. But in some sense, um, there's a temptation to want art to extend beyond uh, the artistic impulse and um, become something functional, um, but then also maybe revert um, and uh, I found that the goal that I was initially approaching was um, how to make this medium uh, accessible. So can anyone just dig a hole and light a fire and you know create some ingot for themselves? Like how can I search for a method that, that would make, in essence, the making portion of monuments accessible to anyone? Uh, so yeah, if you want to play that video clip, um, I was able to get a uh, fire up and above uh, 1200 degrees. Um, that's the melting point of aluminum. If you go too high and you don't have enough of like a slurry to, to really like uh, suffocate the aluminum, um, then you'll get aluminum oxide, which is where we get things like rubies and sapphires from. And then, but you know, that material is then uh, required. Uh, if, if you want to melt that, it's, it's 4,000 degrees, so you can't really melt that. And then there was some, some portion of my brain that was really intrigued of like making a monument out of aluminum oxide, which never could be melted. Um, so if you continue to the next slide, um, my efforts in melting aluminum, and I have actually quite a few, um, examples. Here's one. Um, and this is from, a, if I remember correctly, from like aluminum takeout. Um, and it's pretty hard, you know, it's like a, probably like over a pound there. Um, so in order to kind of get to the point where I had made, like where this, um, where delivery was realized, I, I realized that my method of production was a bit too slow. Um, so I actually worked with a combustion engineer who is like, who I found through eBay because eBay has this whole universe of uh, people who smelt um, and actually like make their own ingot and they stamp them with their own kind of in-house, uh, sometimes comical um, emblems. And so I found this guy, he's like 65 and retired from Washington state. And he designed a furnace um, where he could produce these, these ingot. Um, and he, so I got in touch with him and it was like really exciting because he also was helping me create my own furnace. Um, but because of time and money constraints, um, it was like, okay, I need like, how do we do this? And he created a way of packaging all of the ingot so that they maximize the interior of a USPS uh, flat rate $15 box. 
Um, and I really love the ingenuity and then, you know, the whole history of ingot being um, essentially crafted for hand transport and modern ingot today is now crafted for machine transport. Um, I wanted these ingot to be able to be held in your hand. I wanted actually, you know, um, Jess had updated me at some point and mentioned that some people had taken some of them. Um, and I actually, uh, while I don't advise it, I also kind of think that appropriate because um, in some sense, I, I want this work to be in circulation. I want these ideas of um, currency and recycling and um, empowerment in terms of uh, doing that from your home, doing that with very rudimentary uh, tools and methods. And I want all of those things to feel like they belong to anyone. Um, so there you have it. That's uh, that's as much ingot as I could uh, muster, and it somehow coincidentally came to be that um, it's just about my height. Um, it's just about my width, and I really like the idea of there's all these kinds of like portions of the project that just kind of um, it became such a read on where I was, where I am now, where I see this work. Um, because in some ways, like, I know you mentioned the word anti-monument and in some ways I think of it as an anti-monument but I also think of it as a monument in training. Um, you know, it's, it's there, it is the material for a monument. Uh, it itself in this phase, I think is a monument but as we spoke earlier, uh, you know, my discovery of uh, monuments has been kind of couched within the understanding that uh, a monument is an action of power, right? It's kind of like a proclamation and an ability to um, declare something as being set um, in a specific place and being able to exercise the power that keeps it there. Thank you. Uh, so next, I believe is Kian. Yes, Kian Williams. Kian Williams is a multidisciplinary artist from New York, New Jersey, who works fluidly across sculpture, performance, and video. Rooted in a process-driven practice, they are attracted to quotidian, unconventional materials and methods that evoke the historical, political, and ecological forces that shape individual and collective bodies. Their recent work, including Reaching Towards Warmer Suns, which we'll, which we'll hear about, is now on view at Socrates, uses soil as material and metaphor to explore Black diasporic history and subjectivity. Williams earned a BA with honors from Stanford University and MFA in visual art from Columbia University. The work has been exhibited at Sculpture Center, Jewish Museum, Brooklyn Museum, Recess Art, The Shed, and of course, Socrates Sculpture Park. They have given artist talks and lectures at the Hishron Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Princeton University, Stanford University, Portland State University, Guggenheim, and Pratt Institute. Williams' work is in private and public collections, including the Hishorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Welcome, Keon. Hi, friends. Can you hear me? <clears throat> oh, great. Okay. Um, very excited to be in dialogue um, with um, you both today. Um, so the image um, on the screen is of the work that I uh, made and presented at Socrates, entitled Reaching Towards Warmer Suns, which is a series of upstretched arms and different gestures, um, reaching gestures, um, some are in fist, one is of a middle finger, um, and uh, the all of the forms are made of soil that I source from um, sites of significant sites of significance in the African diaspora. Um, so this first image is an early iteration of reaching towards warmer suns that I installed along um, the James River in Richmond, Virginia. So at the time when I developed the proposal, I was living in Richmond doing a 
one year fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University. It was my first time living like in the proper South and in the like heart of the former Confederacy at that. Um, and one of the things that, sh one of the um, very tangible and visible um, um, reminders of the sort of history of Confederacy and Richmond is like uh, Monument Avenue and Avenue of Richmond that has like these really huge, um, these really huge statues of um, former like uh, Civil War veterans or um, just like, you know, white men who committed war crimes. Um, and those became site, like very active sites of resistance um, this past summer. Um, and so like that was one, I was already sort of like, you know, and getting to know the city, walking through the neighborhood, kind of mining um, how history is like encoded in public space. Um, so that was one experience that sort of catalyzed my thinking around or like approach to responding to like the idea of monumentalism within the United States and wanting to like completely eschew and reject um, those sort of hegemonic conventions. Um, at the same time, I spent a lot of time um, at what's called the Richmond Slave Trail, the Trail of Enslaved Africans, um, which is like a trail in Richmond that uh, marks uh, um, different locations um, in which um, kidnapped, and, kidnapped and trafficked Black people um, first, you know, touched land in the New World, were held in bondage, were sold into chattel slavery. Um, and uh, one part of this trail was very close to my house. Um, and I spent a lot of time doing like these meditative walks along the trail, um, really just like uh, allowing myself to like, in all of my sentience to try and like mine the, the history that quite literally is haunted in the land. Um, and during one of these walks, I saw like, arms reaching out of tree branches. And that kind of became the inspiration for the form of the, the sculptures. Um, and as I continued to, to develop them, um, I thought about and sat with um, this question posed by Black study scholar, Christina Sharp, who in her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, as how does one memorialize chattel slavery and its afterlives, which are unfolding still? How do we memorialize an event that is still ongoing? And so I wanted to approach um, creating or responding to like creating a contemporary monument um, by creating work that doesn't uh, um, represent um, a fixed historical event that is, um, well, like claims to represent an event that is like fixed, uh, but that represents, you know, a history that is very much, um, uh, that continues to haunt the present. I also didn't want to um, create a monument that um, represented, you know, an individual figure. Um, and so I chose to have this kind of collection of arms to sort of suggest the collective experience. Um, and then of course, my choice of material um, sort of eschews the conventions of monumentalism. I use soil as a material. Most monuments are made of bronze or some type of hard, um, some type of metal. Um, and so all of that sort of went into the thinking, both like the conceptual and the aesthetic approach to making a monument. Um, this is an installation shot um, of the work as it is in at Socrates. Um, and one of the things I personally love about it is that like, uh, uh, I appreciate how it like blends into as opposed to imposes on its environment. Um, when I was making it this summer, a lot of people would come up to me and remark that, you know, they initially thought that, you know, 
the the arms were like trees and then as they got closer to it you know because they're like uh it's installed right next to a grove of trees and as they got closer to it they would uh they would realize that oh like these are arms they're not trees um um but that was really important to me that it kind of blended into its surroundings um what else do i have to say about this i think that is it for now Thank you. All right, so finally we have Sandy Williams IV, who is an artist, educator, and filmmaker born in New Jersey and educated in Virginia. Their work is a reckoning against the colonization of our time, the land, and our social me memories with, with a particular focus, currently on the role of public monuments, historic landmarks, and public access. Welcome, Sandy. Hi, um, thanks y'all. Uh, excited to be in conversation with all of y'all as well. Um, so my contribution to the show was this work pictured, um, Wax Monument number four, Free Wax. Um, so as the Roman numeral suggests, this came out of a series of wax monuments that um, similar to Keon Ke started in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I did my graduate studies here at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. And that was in 2017, right after the events in Charlottesville, which I was also um, there for in 2017. So in 2017, there's the white nationalist rally in Charlottesville. I'm there that morning going to work um, and like a, a, a truckload of boys like rides past and throws Nazi salutes at me and they have like Confederate flags and all that. So I left, I was like, I'm getting out of here and, and left that morning and went to Richmond. And then I come to Richmond and it's just Monument Avenue and the, the rallies followed. And so the conversation was really like what to do with these monuments and where, like, where does that violence, like how is there so much violence tied into these objects? that don't move as, you know, we're in sculpture uh, school, we can't not talk about the giant sculptures that people are killing each other or killing other people over. And so in all these conversations, you know, we're suggesting all of these different plans and dreams and ideas of what we could do with that space and that economy. Um, and at the end of the conversations, the city was kind of like, well, thanks for your input. Um, but we're not really going to do anything. Uh, they're like federal property or whatever, so we can't do anything. It turned out to be a lie. Um, of course, like 2020, the uprisings this summer exposed um, that they can do things and they did move them. But in that moment when they were kind of like hands off with allowing the community to actually engage in what the community looks like and what our social landscapes, how they're constructed, um, it was, it was really a moment to realize, um, really understand that lack of agency. And so for me, this project started as a way to try to um, empower us, um, the people with a sort of agency or the possibility of a democracy. And so this is a um, six foot tall by 11 foot wide um, 3,000 pound when it started, wax monument um, in the shape of, you know, like the US flag. Um, it's full of wicks. And so people were invited to melt it, to carve it, to bring things to it, to take things from it, to like express themselves on it. Um, and like, you know, there was really no policing on this object. It, it was just allowed to evolve. Um, it, you know, like I feel like I'm almost repeating a lot of things that Kian already said, but um, so much of what monuments have done is sort of, and, and what Andre was saying too, is impose a sort of um, infinite on, on uh, on the land and in, in, in the sense that there are these objects that just sit in place and collect time and make a, and a certain ideology permanent 
um, while everything else is changing around them, they sit and, and don't change at all. And so in response to that, you know, I wanted to build something that could change and would change and like would inevitably change and crumble and like uh, to make it out of this symbol that is the, the US flag that is supposed to represent, you know, liberty and freedom and, you know, whatever other sort of ideals that they attach to this symbol. Um, so often we find that it, it actually falls short of any of those ideals materially in reality. Um, in, in fact, in reality, like we, we lack most of those things. And so to make, turn, make the symbol, take the symbol from being this flat, sim, uh, you know, ideal and materialize that thing, like make it whole and um, open to that thing that it's supposed to represent. Um, I think that was kind of what I was trying to work with, uh, with the, the, the formal elements of the monument. Um, and then this last photo is kind of like um, a, a later, so it's, we started with day one and sort of saw like a progression of different moments when people were using, um, enacting, you know, that democracy on the thing. And then this is one of the later days during the snowstorm when it's really starting to fall apart as it was planned to. Great. Thank you all so much for, for sharing about uh, your projects at Socrates. And I think there's so much, there's so much alignment, so much connection between all of your approaches and in general, the, the, the whole cohort of artists sort of are, are pushing against these traditional tenets of monuments and monumentalism and not just rejecting them, but proposing alternatives that are more liberatory, more inclusive, more um, imaginative, you know, thinking about asserting the collective over the individual, thinking about like monuments as an as an action relating to power as opposed to objects. Um, and also thinking about the uh, monuments as something that changes and that evolves as opposed to something that's that's stagnant uh, and fixed. Um, so reflecting upon all that and reflecting upon, you know, it's been probably almost a year uh, since the show has been up or in installed and, you know, probably even longer since you've thought about these, these monuments um, and some of your, the work that you shared relates to past work as well. And it's sort of in this like longer lineage. I'm wondering about how your relationship to your, to your monument and or to monuments in general has, has changed and like how, yeah, how you see that change at this point in time in, you know, early 2021. I have some ideas. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll start by saying this was my first time um, making work outside um, and like making work, uh, making like a public art piece. Um, and it was really exciting because it posed like a set of like, you know, challenges, like problem solving challenges for me in the studio. Like how do I get this material, which is inherently fugitive to like hold a form and be able to um, endure like certain elements um, and at the same time, working in public allowed and working in a park during, you know, the pandemic allowed for um, a type of engagement with people um, that wasn't possible, you know, during the summer and um, during that point in the pandemic. Um, and so the, I, bring both of those points up to say that um, having people like respond and react and being able to witness people respond and react to the work um, was really exciting for me um, and fundamentally changed like how I think about not just monuments, but just objects, uh, like seeing people touch and engage mm -hmm. with the sculpture, seeing like, you know, birds perch on the sculptures, you know, like different types of encounters and interactions um, uh, was really exciting for me to witness. I feel like I totally forgot the question, so I'm kind of deviating. 
um, create a, a such a large, you know, object, um, something that so many people could interact with and could could last this year or however long it's been up. Um, so that's been really exciting and interesting to me, just seeing the div the evolution of this object through other people's eyes, through people sending me videos um, over Instagram over the duration of the installation. Um, that's that's totally been such a rewarding um, aspect of of this piece that that took so much uh, like we all put so much into into these objects to, to see people get so much out of them um, was really special. Um, uh, I think, I think kind of like uh, the monument sculpture, monument inspired sculpture um, kind of forced me to confront this idea that um, I really wanted to be able to uh, change it. Like I wanted to be able, I mean, initially I wanted to just stack all of the ingot and just stack it and let the environment happen to it. Um, there's kind of a quality of aluminum that I really enjoy, which is that, you know, it kind of conducts temperature very well. Um, if you look at your air conditioner, your um, heating, you'll see the fins on it and you can like press them and bend them. And, you know, it kind of holds ambient temperature. And I kind of felt like there's this metaphorical aspect of being um, of a material that could contain, you know, the metaphorical temperature of the room, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, um, so I, I ended up, you know, solidifying it so that no one would get hurt um, by toppling it over. And I, I realized like in kind of crossing that line from uh, just wanting to make it uh, this tower, like kind of Jenga blocks of ingot um, and then making it into this thing that I couldn't, nobody could push over um, like that, going from that for, between those two states um, kind of forced the work to approach monumentality. Um, but I think what I ended up doing was, um, uh, I mean, the core of it is uh, welded together aluminum, um, but all of the pieces around it are epoxied fiberglass. And part of my reason for that was that if I like, for example, um, like say I wanted to light the whole thing on fire, right? Like create a big ground, like pit in the ground and create a fire. Um, it would all just melt back into aluminum and each of the pieces could detach. And, you know, so if I felt kind of like, it's kind of the reverse of Sandy's approach, which is like, you're like, oh, I had all these individual candles and now there's this kind of like culminating candle. And then you've, I think the three of us have kind of all wondered to ourselves, like, what is the next stage in the life of our works? Um, and I think like, uh, I think that was, that's an important aspect to each of our works is that they can kind of like become strangely mobile um, and they can kind of be broken down into their commensurate parts and uh, either disassemble, it's kind of like transformers. Mm -hmm. you know, they, can, they, can, they can come together, they can come apart. Um, but I, but that like kind of hanging on to uh or kind of like exploring that tension between the longer it was there um and then the longer i wanted it to be there but then also sustaining um the desire for it to always be able to uh to change and to move and to disassemble mm -hmm. yeah and i love how each of your works the the material choices not only communicate the the conceptual ideas and you know the metaphors and the references but also um sort of end up dictating how it how it changes and how sort of malleable um it is uh we we're talking earlier uh andrea and sort of i i think that like definitely sums it up that that malleability 
you know, of the wax, of the soil, of the aluminum um, as, as that common thread. Um, and then thinking about the, the participatory element, you know, especially under this sort of distant uh, virtual context uh, to have something, something that folks are, are engaging with physically as, as objects um, and, and in a safer way that, that then uh, like an indoor um, uh, location might be for a lot of folks. Um, and sort of relating to that, the, the ways that the environment uh, and the changing environment plays into it. Um, so I wanted to ask about, you know, Sandy, your, your monument is in part in the shape of the Borough of Queens and then Keon, you're sourcing some of the, the soil um, from Elmhurst, uh, Queens. And so I'm curious about, you know, each of you to talk about not just the, not just the, the park, but also any sort of broader considerations of Queens and of New York and any other locations that are sort of embedded in, in your work at, at Socrates. Yeah, and you wanna go first? Um, unless, if you want me to, I can. Sure. I feel like I went first last time. Okay. But I can go. Yeah, do it. I'll do a rock, paper, scissor. You got yeah, it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, sites, but I mean, I feel like a lot of my work begins with like, I feel like as an artist, what I do is like, I'm in the world and I'm a lot, I'm like using the range of my sentience, like sight, smell, sound, taste, and other sort of faculties beyond that to like really just sense the world. And so my work always starts with like me just like walking through different places. Um, and then maybe like, you know, ideas crystallize and, you know, I go back to the studio when things take shape. Um, and so when I first, like I, I mentioned in the beginning, when I first started to do this, uh, first started this work, the project, I was in Virginia and I was sort of responding to a specific site. And then when I came and sort of expanded the work in Queens, I went to, uh, this place in Elmhurst, um, that currently is just like, you know, like apartment buildings, um, in the, the, I haven't read it in a long time. I want to say in the 19th, sometime like in the 19th century, um, it was a, f a, a, a burial ground of, um, of a community of um, formerly enslaved and free um, black people. Um, I'm not sure in the process of like the change of land use and the land development, if like those graves are like exhumed or moved to a different place um, or I don't, or if like these apartment buildings are just built, you know, on top of um, this, this graveyard. Um, and so part of, like, part of when I'm sourcing my material is like, you know, walking to a site and like having these kind of like intuitive, you know, responses. And I'm like, oh, I need to get something from here. And so I had that kind of reaction when I was in, in at this place in Queens. Um, and so I just like, you know, dug up a little bit of soil from like, you know, next to one of these apartment buildings. Um, um, cause conceptually like the, like soil literally holds history. And what I mean by that is like, you know, we think of soil as like, like this kind of inert monolith, but like soil is like a composite of like organic, inorganic material, water, air, um, um, all of these things that are like, all of these different, all of this, all different types of like physical and non-physical matter, um, that's like, you know, broken down to like such fine, you know, uh, elements um, such that they can become, uh, it can become like a catalyst for new life. Um, and so that's like how, you know, when I'm sourcing the soil, I'm like, okay, there's like history in here, like literally the soil, like the particles in it, um, the particles in it um, could be particles from, I don't know, and matter from the 19th century. Um, likely not because 
if it was like, you know, redeveloped by land developer, they probably hauled in a bunch of soil from somewhere else. Um, but like conceptually, that's how I think about, you know, the material. And so like, that's why site specificity becomes, is like important. Cause like, I'm like having these responses, but then you realize that like, oh, everyone in the United States is haunted by the history of chattel slavery and settler colonialism. So like at one point, like, yes, the site specificity matters because it's like acknowledging places and histories and peoples that are like er literally quite literally erased. Um, but then at the same time, you're like, oh, this sort of erasure is um, endemic, you know, on like such a larger scale. Cool. Um, so yeah, going off that, I think I also approach, um, especially the public interventions or performances that I work on with with a specificity that um, is is considerate of of the various paradigms um, of history of oppression um, that exist in the space. Um, so as um, I forgot to mention with my piece, you know it 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 is based um, it, it's surrounded by the map of Queens. Um, because I, I don't think you can have a conversation about monuments without an acknowledgement of like uh, both the land and then like how city planning and development sits on top of that space. Um, because, you know, we made the land acknowledgement before when we, when we first started, you know, this is unseen land that, um, you know, both here in Virginia and in Queens, um, that, the way in which that geography was composed has changed and changed, um, especially through colonization and neocolonization. And um, the monuments are just an extension of that systematic oppression. You know, they sit in space, just like an institution does. You know, just like a um, a, a gentrified a neighborhood becomes gentrified. You know, like um, that occupation and that displacement um, are all part of 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 that systematic oppression. Um, so that was, that's an approach going back to it that I, I come with that understanding with any sort of intervention that I bring to a public space. Um, but especially in the conversation of monuments, which have been so um, in like such a specific tool for that colonization um, to try to um, directly connect the object to the space and to a conversation also about the allocation of that space and the zoning of that space and the mapping of that space um, is, is the way I was thinking about uh, my work. Yeah, and even um, Andrea, when you were talking about sort of your original ideas about the digital space and sort of that as a lo that as a location, and even this sort of space of eBay <laughs> and finding this this uh, this this connection or this the source um, in the process uh, for creating your piece, um, and even thinking about the ways that the process of recycling like displaces these objects and you know sometimes like melds them all together in in a in a um in in a form that is you know both uh, a composite of all the places and then becomes also like a a no place uh so um, yeah i'm curious if you have any thoughts about about that um yeah i do um so the method that I was experimenting with um, is like theoretically the method that um, early iron ore and copper ore was smelted. And um, that method of like creating um, in essence like a, a, a temporary furnace um, is also like the method that I guess ancient people used for um, creating ceramics as well as metals. And um, I think about 7,000 years ago is what I remember. And what I realized in the whole process is how sophisticated um, metal work is. It's really sophisticated. <laughs> um, granted, like we have a lot more crap on our, 
on our aluminum cans and stuff. But um, I think actually, because my, in essence, like my goal was to ground cast and I was actually hoping to ground cast in Socrates, but um, as you can tell from the video, the fires are kind of dangerous. So did not choose that. And so, um, but I felt like, you know, when you ground cast, it actually absorbs some of the dirt too. It gets like trapped, like here you can see in there that there's like portions of dirt, right? And I really wanted these like really like rough um, ingot, right? That were ground cast um, also as a nod to, you know, how sophisticated currency and ideas of value were that we just, and we make up these like, I mean, one of the um, greatest lessons that I've had in my life is going to um, decolonizes anti-Columbus day um, at the American Museum of Natural History um, and I've gone for about three years or four years. I went to a lot of the testimony that um, the city had on forming this panel of monuments panel and then like watch the whole process kind of um, uh, move forward. And uh, I see, I, I feel like you started seeing like monuments as like this extremely professional thing. And I wanted to locate it somewhere deeper in history as well as um, my personal history, which is like, uh, so this, um, this uh, combustion engineer, he actually was uh, smelting aluminum from uh, aluminum uh, engine castings. Uh, so they're all automotive. And I feel like um, I grew up up the street from a junkyard. I've spent a lot of time in junkyards and, um, and it felt somehow like you know, Socrates at one point was a landfill. Um, and then the sense that like, the thing most often found in junkyards is going to be aluminum because copper is more expensive. Steel is more expensive, like everything. <laughs> aluminum is like this uh, kind of neglected uh, material. Um, ironically, it's also gone up in value in the, in the pandemic. Um, but I think what people also forget is like, it's one of the last metals that we all touch. Um, and I think in some of my thinking, I was also kind of taking in this idea that, you know, currency used to be pegged to the gold standard and gold was this kind of uh, like contained um, uh, sense of value. And when Reagan decoupled the dollar from the gold standard, uh, he then made the government as the, you know, he created, you know, the structure where the government was the guarantor of value. Um, and so I, like in, in the work, it was also like, how do we kind of resituate value, reclaim value, but also practice like a kind of smithing or refinement of value in like a, a more ancient form. And it actually like, it was really interesting because if you do have ingot like that, like even one of those bars, right? And you put it in a furnace, which is like a hundred dollars, um, or you can make one yourself. And it's actually not that difficult. Um, but my, my combustion engineer friend has, has uh, helped me out with this. Um, and, and, you know, you can, you can cast your own like S hooks. I mean, who doesn't need a good S hook? Um, but also, you know, you can, like this, the idea that, you know, uh, within your, your own home and your own universe, you could uh, fabricate with not too much uh, effort once you understand the smelting process, or even if someone in your village, town, city, whatever, wanted to uh, recycle aluminum, um, you, you could make all the screws or all the nails for your whatever. I mean, clearly stainless is going to be your preference, but um, but it kind of resituated a possibility where um, kind of closed loop um, manufacturing and collaboration and uh, community empowerment could take place. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you all for sharing. I think Sort of we we've talked about these like embedded legacies uh in 
the monument form and in the some of the materials that uh, you all have chosen and at the other monuments um, are made of and how they're always, you know, as Ken was saying, in, in the wake of these, these histories and these violences really. Um, and I'm curious, it's kind of like an impossible question about the, the future of, of monuments, uh, if, if there is one, um, in, in your opinion, do you, yeah, what do you, what do you see them looking like or being like um, at all? I mean, I feel like, uh, yeah, it's impossible to say, or it's, it's very hard for us to predict what uh, like the political environment is gonna be, you know, like we, we got the opportunity to make these artworks at an art park institution, you know, but uh, a lot of the cities really haven't, you know, like, I feel like these were our, our propositions for mm. what the future of monuments might look like. Um, but what people do with the, these propositions, you know, time will tell. That's kind of how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a more sinister uh, suggestion is that um, if one thinks of monuments as things that are immovable because of the threat of power um, or the execution of power. Um, one might suggest that uh, monuments are not gonna be so easy to see anymore. You know, they're mm. gonna, or they're not gonna be in a traditional form. Um, and so in some sense, like what we know visually and aesthetically as monuments might just kind of secede back into art in some ways. And then, you know, buildings might, I mean, we kind of have monuments in Manhattan right now. They're just like empty buildings that just stand right. and, and stand for what, you know, um, it's just like lots of foreign investment or, you know, elite investment. And they kind of just are these giant obelisks that mm -hmm. no longer house people. Um, they like are more a function of, of power and um, control. Um, but sinister things aside, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would be curious. Um, it would be really interesting to actually solicit a conversation with um, the city's panel that they had generated for the original monuments position uh, or proposal. Um, and um, yeah, and get actual feedback for this mm. proposal. Yeah, and we, we've seen some, yeah, some of those conversations in terms of the the, the city opening up, uh, opening like for, uh, proposals, call for proposals for artists to replace monuments and sort of that, but still having the, like the city panel uh, think about and choose those and often like, you know, the public plays some of a role in that and often has an opinion about like what should or shouldn't replace, you know, say like the Marianne Sims monument in, in the city. Um, and yeah, what, what you're saying about the sort of them returning uh, and in different forms remind me, reminds me of this poem by Calcarero Lopez who it's called After Abolition. Um, and it ends, I'm gonna read the last two lines because I don't wanna <laughs> mess it up. Um, so the poem ends, uh, though prisons and cops won't be found anywhere, our youth still learn of them and they will know what they mean, how they look, how they function and what it will take to stop them if they return with new names. So that sort of like, yeah, vigilance uh, as like future building, um, yeah, it's really uh, striking. Yeah, the um, since you commented on the, on the Marion J. Sims monument, that that whole thing is so loaded. the The whole organism of selecting a new person and how essentially it created this like really intense competition between all these different marginalized artists. Mm -hmm. um, and in my mind, I was like, and for what? you know, 
um, your basic, you know, it's like, it. I actually felt, and I don't know if this is a popular um, sentiment, but I felt that it was somewhat cruel mm. um, to, to kind, you know, to kind of just the whole orchestration of it, um, like unnecessarily so. But um, yeah, I think my original proposal for Socrates was this idea of digital monuments and then, you know, my sense is that it's just, it. there's, as I think each of our works explores, there's there's so much in, in material. Okay. Um, and then on the flip side of things, I also recently like started really exploring the idea of if it's really, really heavy, who's really gonna move it? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, I mean, Sandy, I didn't know that was 3000 pounds. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> unless you take a tip off of it. But I, I just wanted to add quickly, you know, like, to, to the effect of all that, that um, it's it's not just objects, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, the monuments we hold are immaterial. They're, they're the public platforms that we value. Um, and it's, it's everything from the Grammys to, like, Instagram, you know, like, we hold these these monuments that, that hold space in our conscious, in our personal and uh, communal shared consciousness uh and it like to the the end of that poem you know it's how we educate our our, our offspring and each other um and so so like what happens to those monuments is such a it's it's really a, a broad question of like what happens to our culture what happens to our societies um yeah and kind of same answer time will tell but um it i just wanted to to agree that yeah it is this immaterial thing that is more than like the the objects are just like the moments to have the conversations about mm -hmm. the broader subject mm -hmm. Kian any 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 thoughts I think we should just abolish monuments <laughs> I mean, I'm like you know maybe we'll like you know take a gesture from um and uh and like melt them mm. you know into something else i feel like uh i should know i don't know like soviet history well but um i feel like at like the turn of some like political regime um that i wish i could if i'm gonna cite something all the could, all the stalin monuments right they like melted them um did they, but did they like them? a lot of stuff i'm happened. really curious what melting means because uh, I was like foolishly talking to a friend who has used a foundry. I you know that's such a alien um, process to me. And they're they're like, well, Andrew, you know they're not solid metal, right? And I was like, mm -hmm. and then I was like, wait, I know that. Um, and you kind of wonder, um, like, what? How do you melt that thing? Do you like saw it into pieces or something? Like how? I'm so curious what like the disarticulation of a monument is. Actually, it makes me think of um, that show at uh, um, what's that place in Red Hook, uh, Pioneer Works, called mm. White Man on a Pedestal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, that sh that show um, was incredible. Um, and I, I uh, shout out to Kenya was, Robinson. Yeah. Yes. And Doreen Garner. Um, Doreen had made this uh, like silicone casting of uh, Mary and Jay Sims and uh, assembled like a team of um, of performers to dissect this. It's 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 one of the most powerful works I've ever witnessed. It really, like, I have chills right now. Um, that was like an amazing, I like went in thinking about monuments earlier in the monuments issue. Um, I revisited that show in my head like so many times. Um, but I, 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 think, I think it would be important um, to have a broader discussion similar to 
um, Sandy's expression of what are the monuments that artists have to offer if what monuments are are an opportunity for discussion um, and not just you know like Sam Durant <laughs> um, but you know like what is it like for all these institutions across the country to have a show like like this show because um, mm -hmm. clearly you know each uh, the emotional cultures of each of these different places um, Sandy and, and Kiki I've heard you uh, talk a lot about Virginia and I've never been to Virginia um, but I did read about Rappahannock um, and like how there's like this intersection of like Civil War reenactors and slavery um, and uh, so and there was also like this story I read about a woman who collects soil from lynching sites or multiple people who there's a museum or an institution that has these um, soil um, uh, uh, samples. So, I, I mean, kind of the quickest way to abolish monuments is, is to make tons of them in some ways, um, like scale outward and then, and then melt them all down. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, I'll share in the, from the chat, Doreen Garner was a 2016 Socrates Artist Fellow, so you're in a, a rich uh, legacy. And that show at Pioneer Works is mentioned uh, by one of the essayists in our um, Monuments Now catalog um, wow. coming this, this summer. Um, so definitely, mm -hmm. um, yeah, in, in the conversation. Uh, and there's also a foundry at Socrates right now because Guadalupe Maravilla, who's our upcoming uh, solo presentation opening in May, um, is using one for some of his new sculptures, which we're really excited about. Um, there's a question in the chat from Amanda that reads, there's a comment by Frederick Douglass about the Lincoln Monument in Boston that was removed about how it lay, uh, shows how I lay shows one small moment of historical event such epoch and how that might fail at telling the whole story. Monuments are often seen alone. And I'm wondering how the setting of this as a group show shifted how you thought of your work while making it or after it was installed. Um, yeah, I think Lincoln's a good example of the ways in which monuments Fail to tell the story, right? Like Lincoln is sort of romanticized as the person that freed the slaves when there was hundreds of years of abolitionist movements that like led to that moment where, you know, he was just the guy that signed the paper. Um, but like, and yet he's, he's on everything and everywhere and there's Lincoln. Anyways, um, so I, I really enjoyed being a part of a group show um, that, that, you know, made plural that thing that is usually singular. Um, yeah, um, the, the, the question almost uh, is, is my answer to it, but it was, it was great. And I think it, it was a really important aspect to the whole process. That's a really beautiful way of putting it, making plural what was previously singular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I actually wish I had been able to uh, be more active in the outdoor studio there. Um, that would have been pretty fun. Next time. Next time. We got a do over, right, Danilo? Like, <laughs> like, because we had a really fucked up like pandemic time of it, we get like. <laughs> right? Makes sense. <laughs> Groundhog say fellowship, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation and are, are curious to hear a little bit about what you're working on now or what you're upcoming, anything you're excited about, want to wanna plug um, and share with with the audience? 
Can I can I share something that I saw on one of y'all's Instagrams? <laughs> <laughs> what what does that mean? Only if it's Tion. Nikki, I saw your mycelium uh piece, and I'm so excited for you. And I also want to like, I I played around with mycelium once, and I'm so curious what your experience has been like, because I actually let mine get moldy, and then I tried to grow a scoby on top of it. And it got really like weird. It got really weird. It got really weird. <laughs> um, so I was, totally. tell me about your mycelium. Oh yeah, I've started using mycelium as a sculptural material and like um, growing bodily forms using it um, for like larger a larger project that I'm working towards that maybe. Uh, maybe happening in the spring, summer in New York, we'll see given how the world unfolds. Um, but it's been really fun um, working with like a new material, like finding a new conceptual, like entry point into a new material. Um, I dehydrate mine when like it reaches the form and the coloration that I like. Like once it's like, you know, the mycelium has like, eaten all of the food like all the cellulose and it's just fiber um I just like I basically I, I stop it from growing so I just like mm -hmm. heat it up bake it um but yeah it's been really fun um to like make mushrooms or mycelium sculptures sometimes actually mushrooms will grow will have grown out of like a, a mushroom sprouted um but yeah that's one of the things I've been doing in the studio it's really kind of like, it's so peculiar because I, I like I had I had done like a plastic glove hand like in, mm. put it in like a salad container, and mm -hmm. um, after it like dried out and then I was like I was like oh maybe I can like get the scoby to like grow as like a skin on the on the hand, and mm. then somehow, the mushroom sprouted like an arm and it tried to like run away like out of the the container oh wow yeah and then I, like food or water yeah and then I thought maybe it was like gonna sporulate or something um and and um I recently found out that um fungus killed dinosaurs not do you guys know about this an asteroid did not kill the dinosaurs what happened was <laughs> the asteroid came you heard it here first Floated on, <laughs> floated on the planet and it created all this dust um, that then blocked the sun. And because um, only creatures that could regulate their internal body temperature survived because you do that to kill fungus that's growing on you. So if you, so we have 96 or 98, 96.87. <laughs> um, uh, this is me being a scientist. Um, so what happens is uh, that's hot enough so that you know you know you don't get infested with fungus. But with dinosaurs and all these re reptiles, um, they they couldn't they couldn't stave off the the growths. So essentially, you know, asteroid lands, very little sun, lots of decaying vegetables and um, plant plant life, and then um, you you have just fungus everywhere. And the only, oh um, which is also why birds are so um, prehistoric, like they are this prehistoric kind of like link because they were, they're mammal, they, they are warm blooded. Mm. So I was just like, what? And then um, I was like foraging mushrooms over the, over the pandemic. Um, I mean, I, I feel like it was a very pandemic thing to do. People were like foraging in different places just getting getting those survival skills tuned up but um yeah i i would love to share this book with you um i have amassed a very large collection of audiobooks it's called Ooh. the mushroom at the end of the world oh i've uh, read it yeah that's a really good oh, book yeah. i love that book mm -hmm. but i it, haven't listened to it it's good to listen to um yeah, they talk about the maitake mushroom and how it can only really grow in human like to to toxic like like environments or something, um, and so it can't really grow in nature. 
it has to grow in post-human like contaminated environments or something uh which was interesting because it offers up a model of um survival that isn't uh, uh that isn't conflated with like religious purity <laughs> um and like absolutism i guess I'm like, I'm taking notes with this mic and take this back to the studio and think about this. I, there's also this guy, um, Zach Landsberg, who cast a uh, mycelium Christopher Columbus. Do you guys know about this? Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned so much about your projects, but also about uh, fungus. <laughs> Listen, it's really just going to be, it's just all about, it's. It's all about the fungi. It, the, you heard it here first. Um, Sandy, what are you up to? Uh, um, you know, this and that. <laughs> Nothing uh, fully formed, I don't think. I'm mostly grant writing. Um, because I want to do more public projects, but you know, they something of that quantity is not cheap. So it's mostly like grant writing and trying to find ways to keep moving, pushing that momentum um, in like the public arena. Cool. And Kian, anything? Anything? Um... That you have upcoming, you talking about your upcoming project, but is there anything else you want to share? And then Sarah, oh yeah, I can just that. talk about what I'm doing in the studio. Um, I can't necessarily share things that will be coming that will be public because people don't like those things to be talked about until they happen. <laughs> but um, I've been doing, I've been like getting back to just like material exploration. Um, Cause while I really enjoy having like a deeply conceptual framework for my work, I'm also like a sculptor and I enjoy like exploring the possibilities and limitations of soil. Um, and so I've been doing these like pours um, uh, kind of like, you know, inspired by like in the vein of like Linda Bingley's and um, or like uh, um, Richard Serra of just like pouring material onto itself and seeing like how sh what forms and shapes emerge um and so I've been kind of like doing all these different experiments to like make shapes out of soil um and they've been really fun and they've been coming out really great cool um thanks Everyone, I think that hopefully is a good place to transition out for the evening. Um, this was such a wonderful conversation to listen to. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the artists for being here this evening with us. Um, I learned a lot about fungus. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> um, and also, it's so wonderful to hear, you know, all these shout outs to other artists who are in some ways connected to the park, like Doreen Garner is a former Socrates Artist Fellow, Zach Landsberg has worked here for years as an educator. Um, so it's just wonderful that the Socrates Sculpture Park Network is so, um, it's like a, a fungal network, you mm -hmm. might <laughs> say. Um, Really quickly, I want to give a shout out to uh, some upcoming programs. We have an Instagram takeover on Friday, March 19th by 2020 artist fellow Patrick Costello. Andrea Solstad also has an Instagram takeover coming up. And then finally, uh, our one of our programs for uh, artist Jeffrey Gibson's monument project at Socrates, his actual final program for his monument project at Socrates is a performance by artist Raven Chacon, musician Raven Chacon, um, on March 23rd. And that time will be announced on our website at socratesculturepark.org. 
Um, so again, thank you so much. This was a wonderful program and I hope we can all gather in person some, at some point soon, hopefully. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Good night. Take care. Bye.